is the hot new class at your gym, resting. How about that? And uh, this is Jen Murphy from the Wall Street Journal uh, about a year ago. And uh, there's a new trend at gym classes around the country. Americans emerging from more than two years of pandemic are looking for something new in their workouts, a good rest. Gyms say they are seeing increased demand for, for um, gentler classes and they're expanding their mellower offerings. They're also rolling out dedicated recovery rooms equipped with massage lounge chairs and self-massage gadgets. One participant said his workout reminds him of uh, preschool nap time. He lies on a mat with pillows in a dimly lighted room and follows an instructor through a series of gentle stretches while calming music plays. Aptly named Surrender. The uh, the, uh, aptly named Surrender, the hour-long class in this Houston gym has been packed The chain has increased the number of surrender classes by an average of about 50% across the locations compared with 2019. Months of stress and sweatpants have shifted priorities for gym goers, with many saying they now care more about how they feel versus how they look. A recent survey of 16,000 Americans reported 43% are exercising to feel better and 59% to reduce stress. As one fitness expert said, leaving it all on the gym floor doesn't seem like a priority as much and so we are seeing this and i see all kinds of articles that speak to one of the greatest uh, issues that come out of the the whole covid pandemic is really the mental health impact on so many which really seems to be more serious than many people realize and this article you would think that seems like the antithesis to going to the gym right you go to the gym to work out work up a sweat stretch your muscles work your muscles out and uh, and yet they're going there to rest it seems kind of weird and the irony of all this though when you think about it think about like what was going on during COVID? how many people weren't working or were working from home in their sweatpants they were relaxing they were and yet even then people could not find rest in a restless world that's the reality and we're going to talk about that very reality this morning the difficulty uh, of finding rest in a restless world today's brand is the rest of jesus we're going to talk about this idea that jesus knew how to rest in a restless world and it's it's the idea of a life that is well rest and not stressed out we'll talk about those dynamics today in this message and when you think about this brand of rest now i, I was trying to think of what's the right word to to nail this branding for us here's the ideas like uh there are um i must have missed uh something here on the so let me just read it here um there's the idea of prayer like prayer could be one of the components here when we think about this concept of uh of what it means to rest um jesus did in fact pray a lot and we will see that this morning but prayer, though, is, is more about how we access this brand of rest than it is actually the branding itself. Like solitude, that's kind of like prayer. Solitude is another avenue. Jesus found solitude. We need solitude in life, right, in a busy world. And uh, solitude really is, it's, it's not the branding, but it's how we arrive at this branding of rest. And then there is this, the idea of peace, which is really a fruit of the Spirit that's very similar to the concept of rest. And then finally, intimacy, which is, Another avenue that leads us, intimacy with Christ will lead us into rest in a restless world. A couple of verses here that really can kind of uh, just speak to the, the, the significance of rest in our life. Look at, the, look at what it says in Re- Revelations 14, thinking of the afterlife. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. And so people in eternity that, that reject Christ and end up in hell for all eternity, part of the description is they are never at rest. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying hell isn't a literal fire, but I'm saying there's so many more components to hell that we just kind of gloss over and miss. And it's like, it's a place of constant torment. But part of that torment is just, there's no rest. How about the psalmist? Psalm 55, 4 and 6. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. And, and how, how, you know, we have wings like that, right? The wings of the spirit, the wings of prayer, uh, of, our, of our intimacy with Christ that can lead us 
into that place of rest. So the question for us today is, how do I experience rest in a restless world? How do I live a life that is at rest? And I believe the sermon title really nails this for us because the sermon title today really is almost like a paradox, but it's this idea of striving to rest versus surrendering to rest. And if you look at the world, like they're all striving to rest, even if it, even if it means going to the gym and, and working out on your rest. It's like, the world does not have rest outside of Christ. And they are striving and struggling and working. We'll see that today to find rest. Whereas we surrender to rest. And we'll look at exactly what that means as we go through the message this morning. And here's our big idea that really nails it. Here's our big idea. This is my default position. We can say this. My default position, if I'm a Christian, my default position to be in Christ is to be at rest. Did you know that? That if you are in Christ... If you're a new creation in Christ, your default position in in life is you're just at rest. Whatever goes on around you, you're at rest. Which means if you don't experience rest, something's attacking you. There's something you need to subtract from your life. Something, Something outside is impacting you because, and the world doesn't have this. The world's default position is not rest. The world's default position is they're looking for rest. And they can't find it and it frustrates them. So today, surrendering to rest, two intersecting gospel lessons, just two lessons, two two points today. They intersect and they're very helpful. Then our key passage, Matthew 11, 28. We've been here a lot in the last few years. Did a whole series on this a couple years ago to kick off the uh, kick off the new year and yet this is where God kept driving me back to this passage so we're going to just unpack this today and we're going to see uh, just two things in here really that are really significant come to me here's here's what here's what uh, Jesus said come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light so the first of our two lessons this morning the first lesson is simply this i need to learn to trust in christ i need to learn to trust in christ that's where this all begins my rest begins because i'm in christ right my default position is to be at christ so if i just learn to trust in christ i will experience a life of rest in a restless world here's the truth Uh, who or what i am trusting will dictate the level of my rest and I bet you we could just think about that for a minute and be like, oh, that makes sense. If I'm trusting in the stock market and the stock market's going down, I'm not going to have a lot of rest. If I'm trusting in some person and, and uh, you know, like our relationship is maybe in a dysfunctional spot, I'm not going to have a lot of rest. But see, who or what I am trusting will dictate the level of my rest. And the reality is we know this as believers hopefully that there's there's only one place to find true rest and that is in christ come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest that's the first verse there verse 28 and let's just start here because this is a gospel invitation at the base of this whole passage these three verses here it is a gospel invitation it's an invitation where christ is calling out to a restless world saying come to me those who are lost lonely searching and tired come to me and i'll give you rest and, and note that come to me phrase, it's not signifying any kind of work. It's not, you know, come work for me. It's just come to me. I got a gift for you. Just, and, and what it means is put your trust in me and not all the other stuff of the world because there's no work that can actually save us. Now, what's interesting, Isaiah in the Old Testament ministered and spoke to the Jewish people who ironically were a people who were searching for rest. And why do we say ironic? Because what did God give offered to the Jewish people? Well, the promised land. And it's like the land of abundance and the land of rest. And they got there and they rejected it and they continually rejected as, as Yahweh, as, as God reached out to them. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 30, 15. For thus, saith, uh, for thus said the Lord uh, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength, but you were unwilling. All you have to do is just Stop fighting, stop working, just come and rest and you will find everything you're looking for. And the reality is, what we find here is, this is a great picture of Israel's relationship with God and it was never what it was supposed to be. This takes us to Isaiah 55 and listen to these three verses here that sound much like what Matthew says. 
Here's what, here's what Isaiah said uh, to the Jews. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. And what an amazing passage here. And there's like three little things in here. We can note the promise in this passage. Um, uh, I got these out of order here. The the promise is is to come and be satisfied. He's like, just come. Come and, and, and and, and just find your satisfaction in me. The milk and the wine, and the water, and the, and the rich foods. You notice that? It's rich foods. I thought rich foods weren't good for you. <laughs> well, God offers us the richest foods, and they're, they're delicious. And, and he just says, come. And they all represent the spiritual blessings that are found ultimately in Christ. Just come to me. And then there's this paradox here, right? Did you catch the paradox? Come, come and buy, but without money. Your, your money's no good with me. Isn't that kind of wild? Like, come and buy, <laughs> But no, you can't buy with any money. What is God's currency? Well, God's currency is belief, really. We talked about that, right? It's just belief, it's trust. It's not even the grander work of, of like we're saved by grace through faith and we saw that back on Easter that, that God offers the grace but Jesus, he, he supplied the faith. He went to the cross in faith, did all the heavy lifting. We just believe, we just believe, we trust that Jesus did that. Yeah, I, I trust you did that. I, I believe that, I'm putting my trust in you and, and so that's our currency is belief or trust. I think that's really kind of fascinating. And, and then there's, there's this one, right? The promise, come and be satisfied. You know, I was thinking about this. Um, I think tomorrow we're taking the kids and we're going to, uh, to um, I'm taking the kids to Pizza Ranch. Chad loves to go to Pizza Ranch. Anybody like to go to Pizza Ranch? Anybody not been to Pizza Ranch yet? Okay, I'm taking you. <laughs> if you like pizza and you like chicken, it's like heaven. It's like best chicken around. But you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So when you go to a buffet like that, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, how do you know when the meal's over? Yeah, right? You want to get your money's worth? It's like, oh, I couldn't get another bite in me. It's time to go home, you know? And you stuff it in, you know? And it's like, I think it's, it's so interesting here. It's like they're spending all their money on these things and they're not satisfied. It's like, that's like, yeah, why would you? It's like going out to eat, you know, and going home hungry. It's like, that would be so discouraging. And so I think that's fascinating here. The promise, come and be satisfied because you're not satisfied with what you're doing right now and so this all speaks to the jewish people but it relates back to us today and it's so similar to what matthew says in matthew 11 go back to matthew 11 again so uh oh the problem what did i do there uh i i had an extra slide in there it's the problem striving for that that doesn't satisfy so one of those slides was in there twice and threw me off the the the, the problem though is they're striving for that which doesn't satisfy them and yeah, how sad is that? So go back here to Matthew again. And, and he says two things here. Come and learn. This is verse 29 now. So what we see is this is a gospel invitation, but it's also an everyday invitation. It's like, yeah, you were saved by the gospel and then you're sustained by the gospel. You're sustained by Christ. And so every day come and first learn from me. And, and, and just think about the reality of that, that no one has ever left a bigger mark in the world than Christ. So think about that. We're going to learn from Christ. Take my yoke uh, uh, upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And, and just think about it. Come and learn. And I, I'm reminded of that phrase again. Jesus lived my life so I could live his life. So I can learn from him because he lived my life and shows me how to live my life, if that makes sense. One of the fascinating things about Jesus uh, it's always struck me is that you watch Jesus. So Jesus, <clears throat> the most important mission in humanity right and he's only here for 33 years and only three years a little over three years is actual ministry like what are you doing the other 27 years of your life jesus it's like you got a really important job you know if we only had like 15 years yeah you graduated 18 only had 15 years you'd, you'd be like man i gotta get this done and this done and this done and this done and i gotta get married and have three kids and 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 you know visit italy and all the stuff you gotta get done before you're you gotta leave your mark on the world and What's fascinating about Jesus 
you never ever see Jesus run anywhere. He never ran anywhere. Like he would, he would never be like in the car thinking, oh, I gotta go a little faster than 65 here because I'm not gonna make it on time. He, he, no, he just, and sometimes he was intentionally just slow and deliberate. And he did a lot of one-on-one ministry which would seem so unproductive like you only got three years don't waste your time with one woman make sure you got at least 500 every time you say something so i think it's fascinating and then there's also this take my yoke and and this idea of taking my yoke is simply the idea of trusting and this is what's so beautiful because this is our internal reality today in christ like we are not yoked externally this is the picture uh, back in the day was they they would have a, a very seasoned old strong ox and then they would take a rookie ox you know like a new young rookie ox and they would partner them together yoke them together and the strong ox would carry all the load and the rookie ox would learn what it's like to do this and hopefully someday would grow up to be the strong ox and carry a rookie but but here's the point is like this idea of taking our yoke is trusting and it's we are yoked internally to christ christ is in me and i am in in him and we are one and this is the reality of how we are supposed to live our life every day so the question then is where is my trust who or what am i trusting in in this world because remember who or what i trust will dictate the level of my rest And so some people today trust in a bottle, some trust in a career, some trust in a relationship, some trust in the government, whoa, some trust in the stock market, and some trust their own hard work. And here's the thing, some of those things are actually blessings. Your career can be a blessing. The stock market could be a blessing. Like, some of these things can be blessings, but when we put too much trust in them, they become burdens. They they become stressful burdens that we carry through life. So... Yeah, we have the everyday invitation. Then we have this. We have the everyday example. How about an everyday example? Again, Jesus lived my life so I could live his. Let's go to a very memorable scene in the Gospels. This is fascinating. I saw this. You know, it's funny. You can read a story, and each time you read it, God will show you some new nugget that you never considered before. It's in Mark chapter 4, and Jesus and the disciples are in the boat, and the storm comes up, and a great windstorm arose, And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So, question, should the disciples not have been concerned about the storm that was maybe going to capsize their boat? Right? It sounds like, you know, it's like Jesus kind of, does he reprimand them? And he woke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea peace be still and the wind ceased and there was a great calm and he said to them why are you so afraid have you still no faith and they were filled with great faith and said to one another who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him and i got hung up here because this is the key phrase i want us to look at this line teacher do you not care that we are perishing and i realized this week i've misheard this verse for a long time like so when they say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Who, who, is, who does the we represent? The disciples are saying, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Who are they referring to by the we? Themselves, right. Right, the, the, themselves. Like, do you not care that we are perishing? Ah, but remember, Jesus lived my life so I could live his. He's going to teach us a lesson here. So when he says, excuse me, when he says, do you not care that we are perishing? Actually, he's including Jesus in the we. You're one of the we. You're one of us. How do we know this? Because when he calms the storm, they're like, we didn't expect that. Like they were shocked. And and the point is, don't you care that we're perishing? Why aren't you helping bail some water with us? Why aren't you helping us here? It's like, you know, don't you care that we are perishing? And Jesus is part of the we. Because he's living our life so we could live his. And what he's doing here, this is so beautiful, is that Jesus was resting in the storm because he was trusting in the Father. And you know why he wasn't worried about this storm? Why was Jesus not worried about the boat being capsized and them all, you know, meeting their maker? Because he knows he's going to the cross in about three years, two years. He knows he's going to be around. He's got a mission the Father has for him. The mission's not going to let, Father's not going to let them go under in your life when we're in storms he'll be there for us and if we do go under there's just something better for us right 
But I just think that is so fascinating. And so Jesus is teaching us how do we handle the storms of life that we think will ravage our family or our faith or our finances. They don't have to. We can rest in the storm because we can simply trust in Jesus. And again, Jesus is living our life so that we could live his and, and again, this goes back, like Jesus here is sleeping in the boat. See, this is the, <clears throat> when I talk about how Jesus lived our life and didn't play the God card and didn't always use his omnipotence, this is a really tough one for people because they're like, well, certainly he used it here. He calmed the storms. And I'm like, no, I don't think he did. I think he calmed the storms through the power of the Holy Spirit and under the authority of the Father because if he did it on his own power, that blows the whole that blows the whole reality that he's living our life and, and teaching us how to handle the storms of life because we don't have a God card. We have to trust God, and Jesus was trusting God and showing us how to trust God as well. So think about the things in life. We will face stressful things in life. The death of a loved one, that dreaded pink slip, the end of a marriage, the loss of a friend, the lie that spreads, the rumor that won't die, the cancer that takes over, the bills we can't pay, the depression that won't end, the hurt that won't go away, the guilt that won't let up, the doubt that won't give in, and the questions that won't answer. We face all kinds of stress in life. And the question is, what do we do? Where do I turn when I need to be loved, encouraged, affirmed, heard, held, comforted, secured, or strengthened? Where do I turn and who do I trust? And this is where what I talk about often, these, I, this issue of coping mechanisms come in. Because see, if I'm not trusting in Christ, I'm trusting in the flesh. What is the flesh? It's, well, it's the worldly mindset. It's, it's trusting in myself and my own strength and my own wisdom and my own ability. It's not trusting in christ the disciples are trusting in the flesh they're throwing all that water out and we never heard them stop and say lord can you help us and they didn't wake jesus up and say hey jesus let's have a prayer meeting get your dad let's have a prayer meeting here about this let's pray that we get through this storm it's like no they were doing it on their own in their own flesh and they didn't have rest and that's a picture of so many people today and often us. And so we get to this idea of coping mechanisms. And so I, I didn't put it on the screen. I'm sorry, I wanted to put this on the screen. I forgot to do that. But they're on your handout notes. But let me read through some of these coping mechanisms. Here they are. Unhealthy habits, destructive vices, idolatry, sexual immorality, gluttony, selfishness, victim mentality, a defeatist attitude. A, an offensive attack, a defensive posture, anger and hate and bitterness and jealous envy, revenge and blaming others, sorcery. Sorcery, we can deal with our, you know, compromised beliefs, boasting and bragging, pride, you know, pretense, indifference, sadness, guilt and shame, hiding, escaping. And what's interesting when we look at what is causing us stress in life and we look at our common coping mechanisms in the flesh, we may actually see some overlap. Think about that, like, like I'm stressed out by certain things and my coping mechanism is the same as that stressful thing. That can actually happen in life, right? I'm stressed out by, you know, some relationship thing and how do I deal with it through some unhealthy habit, you know? I, you, people use alcohol or, or, or people, you know, they have questions in life and so they go to somebody who will read their palms or, you know, like just crazy things that we do, coping mechanisms in the flesh. And what does that teach us when sometimes there's overlap between what stresses me out and my coping mechanisms? It tells me two things here. Let me jump ahead. It tells me some of the stress I face in life is simply self-afflicted. And I think we all know that. But, but we, we have stress in our life simply because we make poor choices and, and some of it is just self-afflicted. It's not done to us. It's that we, you know, kind of, yeah, we're just trusting in our flesh. And then at the same time, sometimes how I handle my stress makes it work worse. Like if I handle the stress in my life with my fleshly coping mechanisms, it's just going to make it worse. But the quicker that I can turn and I can rely on Christ and find my answer in Christ, boy, how much quicker the stress will leave. So two questions there. What stressful situation am I currently facing is there something, I bet you all of us could identify some sort of, some, some it's a bigger stress, some it's a smaller stress. Some stress you don't deal with it and it gets bigger, right? You know how that goes? And then how am I facing that stress in my life? And again, what I'm trusting in will dictate the level of my rest in life and 
So, yeah, don't trust in the wrong thing. At the same time, I can just throw this out there too. As far as coping mechanisms, here's the coping mechanisms of the Spirit. And I don't think this verse is on the screen either. Um, but Romans 8, 6 says this, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace, and we can add rest. And so here are the Spirit coping mechanisms, like faith, hope, love, joy, Grace, gratitude, peace, forgiveness, prayer, the word, patience, any of the fruits of the Spirit. You can just, there's scriptures there. What that simply means is that when you're facing stress in life, you can cope with them in the flesh or you can cope with them in the Spirit. And some of these ways, you can see how they could directly re reflect back to the stress that you are facing. Again, my default position to be in Christ is to be at rest. So if I'm not experiencing rest, it's because I need to trust the lord so here's our second point so i need to learn to trust in christ here's the second intersecting gospel lesson today if i trust in christ then i can rest in christ it's that simple if i trust in christ then i can rest in christ and the more deeply that i trust in christ the more fully i can rest in christ and it's true if you're not trusting in christ you're not going to have rest in a restless world you're just simply not now again we're learning from jesus and jesus is a great teacher he lived our life so we could live his so he shows us how to do this and i just think about that that if i am in christ then i can be at rest and this takes us back to this morning's sermon title really surrendering to rest and you can look at that in two ways surrendering to rest you can read the sermon title in two ways we've seen it the first point the first point right i need to trust in christ it's the idea that it's external. It's surrendering to Christ. It's trusting in Christ to experience rest. So I, I, I follow, you know, where he leads me. I'm obey, obedient to him. I trust him externally. You know, I'm following him, and I find rest in that regard. But the other way to understand the sermon title is internally, and it's surrendering to the restful nature, nature uh, the spirit that is within me. Because if I'm in Christ, my default position is to be, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm in Christ, Christ is in me. And yeah, I have a spirit of rest within me. When I don't walk in that spirit, when I walk in the flesh is when I don't have rest. And so externally, that's the other way to understand that. And that's the second point here that we're looking at this morning, that if I trust in Christ, then I can rest in him. And I love that because that's biblical and it shows us how easy it is to live a life of rest. It's, it's right here. It's that accessible to me. It's that accessible. Look at Philippians 3 a minute. Philippians 3. But whatever gain I had counted as, but whatever gain I had, this is Paul's testimony, right? Um, he was struck down on the road to Damascus. He's now a servant of Christ. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And verse 9, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Christ, literally... The faith of Christ, again, that goes back to what we learned at Easter. Um, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This has always been one of my most favorite passages and verses over the years. And I love some, some things in here. So here, here's the thing. First, I find rest in the knowledge of Christ. I find rest in the knowledge of Christ. And I've always loved this passage because here's the, here's the beautiful thing. Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus 25 years earlier. He's been a servant Christ for 25 years. And after 25 years, Paul says, I just want to know Christ. And I think that is so true. There is this wonderful, beautiful reality that the more we know Christ, just think about this, the more we know Christ, the more we want to know Christ because we, we sense how much more there is to know of Christ. Did you get that? The, the more we get to know Christ, the more we want to know Christ because we can sense how much more there is to know of Christ. What a beautiful reality. The truth is to know Christ is to realize how little you really do know him. Like he's just so amazing. He is so incredible. And we get to know a little bit of him and we're like, wow, wow, there is so much more to know about Christ and we'll spend all of eternity getting to know him. 
I think that's powerful. And so Paul looks back at his past and he kind of laments of, of, that all the things he trusted in before Christ. And he can juxtapose their absolute worthlessness now with his trust in Christ. The law, his heritage, his pedigree, his past, his performance, his resume, it was all about him, all about his glory. And then he met the truly glorious one, struck down on that road by that blinding light, and he was never the same. And he's like, okay, that is some glory. That is, what was that? And the rest of his life, he pursued Christ. I think that is so incredibly beautiful. And what's really amazing is that Paul, after he was saved, he, think about this, after he was saved, he, he, he suffered the same persecution that he doled out. Like he, he really, he, think about everything Paul en- endured after he was saved. You know what? Ask Paul, he'll tell you, he had more rest and peace after he was saved than before. How does that work? How does that work? Like, you go through more difficulty and you have more peace and more rest. Why? Because you're in Christ. Because when you're in Christ, you can be at rest. I also find rest in the life of Christ. I just love this. Go back to Philippians 3 again. Um, uh, He says, I want to know Christ. That's that Greek word, gnosko. And there's two primary words used in the Bible for to know. And, and gnosko is the one word. They both kind of have similarities. But this is the word that talks about knowing Christ experientially and knowing, in, knowing him intimately. It's, it's, just, it's, it's that kind of knowledge of anybody. It's knowing a person. I want to know you. I don't want to just have head knowledge of you. Paul had all kinds of head knowledge of Yahweh and his theology was all messed up. And then he meets Christ and he's like, oh, I just want to know you. Like, I want to know you personally and intimately and experientially. Here, here, this came, I found this, uh, a word study on this word genosco um, from the Ezra Project. The word genosco, on the other hand, often describes the kind of knowledge involved in building an intimate relationship with a person. In fact, genosco is tied so tightly to relationships that it is used to describe the sexual relations between a husband and a wife. At at the day of judgment, Jesus declared many would claim to be his followers, but he would say, I never knew you. Of course, he knew the facts about them, but he had no personal relationship with them. The apostle John loves to use genosco to describe this deeper person-to-person knowledge that characterizes God. Jesus chose genosco to describe the intimacy between the father and the son, as well as the connection between himself and his sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know, genosco, my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father. More than mere acquisition of facts, this knowledge leads to love and obedience. And this is what Paul's talking about. I want to know you personally. I want to know you experientially. I want to know you in my life. I want to know you. And there are three words back there in Philippians 3 we can, we can zero in on. Verse 8. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And knowing, he wants to know Christ. That's the base level, just this intimately knowledge knowledge of Christ. But then look at verse, uh, again in verse 8, he says this, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Here, gain, he wants to know Christ in him. Like as his life. We always say Christ is our life, right? Christ is our life. And he wants, he, wants, he wants to gain Christ. He wants to know Christ intimately as his life. In his trials, in his grief, in his heartache, in his stress, in his struggles, in his ministry. And then, verse 9, and be found in him. Oh, I love this. He wants to know himself in Christ. Do you see how that works? Like, I want to know Christ in me, and I want to know myself in Christ. To see himself in Christ, to be found in him. I want to gain him and be found in him, and these are all the things that Paul teaches us back in Philippians. Oh, I just love this. I just love this. I just love this. It is really powerful. You know, this always reminds me of Noah and the ark again, right? Because those, Noah and the ark, those were the ones that, the ones that were in the ark represent those of us who are in Christ. And those that were in the world represent those that are in the world. And the storm was ravaging the world and ravaging the ark and throwing the, and they could, they were in the ark and they could hear the screams of the people and the the boat being ravaged all around as the storm took off and yet there was rest in the ark. 
There was rest in a restless world when they were in the ark, and I think that is so incredible. Look at this, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, The point here, yeah, so, so go back here a minute. We're talking about knowing Christ personally and experientially, knowing him in me and knowing myself in him. And the reality is we do. We come and we learn from Christ. Like this is the everyday invitation. And one of the things Jesus teaches us is that prayer was such a significant part of his life. Prayer really was. And so we are told here, Paul says, come and pray. And where did Paul, of course, learn? He learned from Jesus himself. He's following Jesus' example. But look at some of these verses that just describe (coughs) how Jesus approached life and how prayer was so integral to his life. Luke 5, 16, here's three different translations of this. Yet he frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Um, New American Standard Bible. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And the uh, Holman Bible says, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. It seems like a regular thing for Jesus to, to just get away and to spend some time in prayer with the father mark 14 and after he had sent the crowds away he went up on the mountain by himself to pray and when it was evening he was there alone again to pray we see this in mark 135 and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed luke 6 12 in these days he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to god jesus prayed he prayed early he prayed late he prayed before big decisions he prayed before you know stressful situations he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and you know he showed us for instance like what's so amazing about the 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 life of jesus you watch him and you really don't see him ever show much stress do you until when cross isn't that amazing he lives his whole life he knows the cross is coming no stress about the cross until when after he spends time with the disciples and everything's buttoned up and he's you know debriefed them like what's coming and and then he goes out to the garden and he deals with his stress and he deals with it by he just prays he prays so intensely that he's he, he sweat drops of blood and it's just crazy like yeah we don't see stress until he deals with it in prayer and he just never worried about it but there was some stressful situation there certainly to be addressed and he did address it and this is so critical i heard driving into the church today someone on the radio and they said this thought it was so cool it's like it was somebody talking to a bunch of kids talking about the importance of breathing how breathing is so important to sustaining our physical life you take away breath and you know your physical life is And then they made the beautiful point that prayer is the same to our spiritual life. Like prayer is like breathing to our spiritual life and it sustains us spiritually. And I think that is the reality that we see in this passage. And so I think that's really, really, really powerful. You know, when we think about uh, calming our spirits in a restless world, prayer is so significant to that. There is one misnomer about prayer. Some people think that if you pray, it will draw you closer to Christ. You understand that doesn't work? You understand why that doesn't work? Why prayer will not draw you closer to Christ? Where is Christ? You can't get any closer. It reminds you how close he is. It reminds you that you're in him and he's in you and he's he's right here. That's the beauty of prayer. So we don't pray, oh Lord, come fill my life. Come be close to me. Come, No, it's Lord, remind me that you're with me in everything I face. And can I just say something else about having a quiet time? I just say this, like, quiet time, you know, you get your notebook and you get your pen and you get your Bible and you get up 15 minutes early or 30 minutes early and spend some time with God. That's great. Not saying you shouldn't do that. But let me just say, that is a, quiet time is a blessing, not a burden. For a lot of people, the quiet time is a burden. It's like, we feel so guilty because we didn't get up early and have our quiet time for the last two weeks. I'm just saying, hey, it's a blessing. And, and, as much as Jesus prayed, as much as he teaches us about prayer and intimacy with the Father, there is no verse that says Jesus got up every morning at 5.30 and spent 30 minutes with the Lord. He spent time with the Lord all the time. And I think that's so powerful for us to know because we all wrestle with that. We all struggle with that very 
issue. It's a blessing. It's not a burden. And can I also say that if you get up and spend quiet time with the Lord, please do not check a box off and say, done. Because Jesus didn't check anybody. Jesus spent all day with the Lord. Praying without, season is just, praying without ceasing is just constantly being in that attitude of prayer. Let me give you one last passage this morning. We'll close here. So then, there remains, Hebrews 4. Rick read this for us earlier. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And we can simply know Christ. I find rest in the Sabbath of Christ. I I find rest in the knowledge of Christ, in the life of Christ, and in the Sabbath of Christ. And if you read through Hebrews, it's amazing. Hebrews spends 13 chapters telling us that Jesus Christ is better and supreme. He's a better prophet. He's a better priest. He's a better promise. He's a better hope. He's a better way. He's a better everything And yes, he is a better Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. He really is. And I think we sometimes just do not understand that. If I am in Christ, I can be at rest because Christ is my Sabbath rest right here. You know, on on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. That's what we're talking about, the Sabbath rest. On the cross, Jesus said those words, it is finished, and he gave up the spirit and died. And I think that statement is so much more weighty and so much more significant to our everyday life than we realize. When Jesus said it is finished, it meant his work was done. His work of making us righteous, his work of redeeming us, his work of offering us forgiveness, his his work of setting things up so I can be in him and he can be, it was all done. There's nothing else to be done, nothing else that can make me closer to Christ. It's just mine to receive now. Yeah, it, the ball's in my court. God's not forcing him into anybody's life, but he says now, yes. And so the reality is on the cross, humanity was rescued, sin was rendered powerless, death was defeated, Satan was conquered, hell was vanquished, and we were all afforded a life of rest in Christ if we just choose it. And then we have the everyday invitation to live in that life of rest. What this means for us is that when we come to Christ, when we answer Isaiah's call to come and drink and Matthew's call to come and rest, we truly can because the work is done. And this is what's so beautiful. Watch this. I mentioned this a couple weeks back. But the reality is today, like, you you remember in the Bible, like, God worked six days and rested on the seventh. God worked six days and rested on the seventh. But something happened after the resurrection of Christ. And we find this, that they began to worship on the first day and not the last day. It's like, it's like the Sabbath day kind of got moved to Sunday. But it's not really called a Sabbath because we're not under the law. We're not under a Sabbath. But here's the reality today is I don't work to rest. I work from my rest. Like I don't work six days and like, okay, I need to rest from my work. I rest and then I work. And that's the mentality God wants us to have today, that we work from a state of rest. Um, here's the two verses. Colossians 2.16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink uh, or with regards to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. We're not under the Sabbath uh, as far as the law goes. Christ is our Sabbath and he's with us and we can Sabbath every single day. But in the Gospels, Resurrection Day, like repeatedly it says on the first day of the week, it says that over and over. And then we see two times. We see in Acts 20, Paul preaching on the first day of the week and then 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. It's like they transitioned to Sunday. And they're worshiping, they're gathering on Sunday. Why? Because they are now resting on the first day of the week and everything they do comes out of that rest. I was thinking about our mentality on this is kind of messed up, right? Like, why do we take vacations? To rest, right? Like, we earn my vacation and then you, you earn your vacation at work and then it's like, yeah, you know, and like, so you get a couple of vacations every year to rest. That's our mentality. Um, what, what do we do? We work, 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 work for years and years and years to do what? Retire. Yeah, right. You know, the mentality is all wrong. And what if we looked at our vacations and the Bible doesn't even, even talk about retirement, so 
it's another thing. But what if we looked at our vacations and the, the, you know, the, the day we take off every week? Um, uh, how about the few minutes we spend? What if we just looked at those as components of living a well-rested life? It's just how I live out the rest I have in Christ. The point is, um, oh, the point is, as brand ambassadors, we want to make sure that the gospel is attractive. If we are burned out, stressed out, and giving out, then how many people will really be drawn to the gospel? I would doubt many. Yet if people can see us living a fruitful, productive, satisfying, and happy life where we are well-rested individuals, people will just ask us what our secret is, then we can introduce them to Christ. I'll give you one last sentence here. It says over there in Hebrews 4, Verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Let us therefore strive to enter, I thought that sounds like the world, like the world's striving. They're working to entering rest. What's, what does he mean there? And I thought about that. What does it mean to strive to enter that rest? Well, I think today's passage really answers what that looks like for us. Because for the world, they're striving and struggling and working to find rest. And he says for us, strive to enter that rest. And I think it's really as simple as this, striving to rest is the same as yoking ourselves to Christ. That's what it's like. We just yoke ourselves to him and he will lead us through life. Sure, we're, there's work to do, there's work to be done, but we can do it from a position of rest each and every day. Let me read this as I close here today. This was really powerful. In May 1853, Phoebe and her husband Holden Judson joined a covered wagon train near Kansas City, hoping to reach Washington Territory by mid-October. This was a distance of more than 2,000 miles over the rough Oregon Trail. Like all wagon trains, they elected a captain. His word was the law. Well, they chose Rever Gustav Hines, only to be surprised one Saturday night when he announced the train would never travel on Sundays. Phoebe was shocked. They had a half a continent to cross at, at oxen pace, 15 to 20 miles per day on a good trail. With mountain passes and innumerable river crossings ahead of them, she sat in her wagon and just fumed. One family deserted the train and joined another. On their first Sunday, while they stood still, one train after another passed them by. They started out again on Monday, only to reach their first river cross on Tuesday evening. A long line of wagons stretched out ahead of them, waiting for the single ferry to carry them across. They waited three days. On Saturday, they resumed the journey, only to be told they would still rest the whole next day. Phoebe was livid. This made absolutely no sense to her. Then a, week, then a few weeks later, she began to see scores of dead oxen, mules, and horses along the trail. They had been driven so relentlessly, they had collapsed and died. She grudgingly admitted that perhaps the animals needed a day of rest. A few weeks later, she ruefully admitted that maybe the men needed it too, since they walked most of the time. Then she slowly began to notice that as they worshipped, ate, rested, and even played together on Sundays, it had a remarkably beneficial effect upon people's spirits. There was less grumbling, more cooperation. She even noticed that they seemed to make better time the other six days. Finally, what totally sold her on the value of the Sabbath happened one Sunday evening. The family that had deserted them came limping into their campsite, humbly asking to rejoin them. She had assumed they were at least a week ahead. In fact, they had fallen behind. Their own wagon train had broken down. Of course, they welcomed them back. And so it happened that they reached their destination in plenty of time as friends and out of the 50 head of cattle with which they began, only two were lost. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the rest we have in you, that if I'm in Christ, I'm at rest. That's my default position. And Lord, just teach me, uh, like Jesus, to just enjoy life, to slow down, to, 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 to plug into you and, and let you set my agenda and let you set my schedule. I pray this for all of us, and that we would understand the beauty of, of taking a day of rest, of taking a Sabbath, of dealing with our stressful issues through the Spirit, not through the flesh. Thank you for just this weekend again and for those that have given us the ability to enjoy it through their sacrifice. Pray you'll bless many who have served our country. And now bless us as we go ourselves uh, in separate ways this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we will end there. Thank you so much. What a good day.